Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna work our way through uh, what's on Twitter uh, together, looking at commodities. Uh, the hot topic right now is natural gas. We've had a pretty big pullback in natural gas. So I'm sharing a lot of retweets on natural gas. I'll pull up a, a chart and show you the Elliott Wave theory and where we might be in Elliott Wave of this pullback, which I think we're real close to being done. Uh, we're going to look at yields on different time frames. I'll show you <clears throat> what a short-term time frame and a longer-term time frame and how you can be bullish and bearish at the same time on yields. So uh, I'm going to walk through a bunch of different things, commodity-related and or stock market-related, uh, and give you my financial opinions. Uh, again, if you need any help with commodity-related information or you need to, you want to learn something, uh, you want to see what I'm doing with my portfolio in this commodity bull market coming up, you can check out finding-value.com. Uh, you can sign up to become a Platinum member. You can use the word discount in the coupon code, get a discount. And you can follow me. We have question and answer sessions every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, it's posted the times. Uh, our next one is Saturday, 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So let's dive in here. I'll, sh I'll, I'll give you my opinions. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at finding underscore finance. It's the big FV symbol. So... Um, Henry Hub. So back to Henry Hub. That is the natural gas. Uh, so Henry Hub natural gas, worst monthly performances ranked. We currently have back-to-back -back months in the top six. So looking at the worst months, we've got 12-1-2022, and we've got 1-1-2023. Back-to-back months in the top worst six. So what happened? What happened? So we look back, <clears throat> really, we were tied to world pricing with all of the liquefied natural gas terminals that were up and running. Freeport had an accident last year and they didn't get that. It was, it was in June of last year, June 14th, if I can remember. And I said, oh crap, we've got that going down. We could see some downward pressure in natural gas. So Freeport, we at least collectively, a lot of us were thinking that Freeport could turn back online uh, during 2022, but that did not happen. It is still not back up online, running at 100%. Uh, I do think it's going to be coming up soon, but uh, really what it did is it, it locked a lot of natural gas in America where it didn't get shipped out over to Europe. Europe also had incredibly warm weather. Uh, that is, I would say, impossible to some extent to predict uh, the weather. And the weather does impact natural gas supply and demand. So they are at really high inventory levels over in Europe, and the weather has not been that cold. And they have really lucked out, and good for them, uh, with pricing of natural gas falling quite rapidly uh, over there uh, because of the unusually warm uh, winter weather. So that led us to some of the worst performances of natural gas uh, this past year you know, past while. So we've pulled on back on natural gas and I'll give you some charts and, and show you what they look like. And we're going to show a whole bunch of different charting. Uh, it's not just mine. I'll, I'll do some Elliott wave. And then we'll also look at some other people's opinions on, on natural gas pricing. So I've got that. I also share a natural gas, JP Morgan, the need for economic production curtailments uh, increases. So there could be less drilling for natural gas. Uh, some of these, the natural gas price could go lower than where we are today, but um, they go through it here. And if you want to read through this article, um, you can do that by joining the, the Twitter. So here is uh, yield. So I'm going to go between natural gas and yields. Uh, markets are assuming it is a given that the Fed only cuts 25 basis points, 50 basis points. is being overly discounted in IMV. If you look at the rate of USD devaluation, this reimports inflation from producer nations with stronger currencies. Remember, we told you of a USD CNH head and shoulders almost at its target. So this is the US dollar versus the Chinese yen. We have a shoulder, a head, and a, sho a right shoulder, and we're heading on down. We have a bear flag there, if we were to put that in, and then we've come all the way down and target targets are weighted down at this level way down here. So we could see a weaker U.S. dollar, uh, and it is a head and shoulder pattern that we've broken to the downside of the neckline at 7.025, uh, and we're going to head lower. 
looking at uh, Bannerman versus Apple. We've got a lot of different information in here. So it's just for giggles, Bannerman could really outperform Apple in the years to come. This is commodities over technology companies. And we, we're, we're doing a lot of ratios. We can do a ratio of anything against anything. And I people say, well, what does that mean? We're just looking for outperformance. We're looking for things that are cheap when you compare an asset to an asset. And right now, this could be uh, a shoulder head, shoulder development that eventually breaks to the upside where Bannerman could vastly outperform Apple. At least um, what Uselink has posted here. So that's one of the potential outcomes. We've got another one. This is log scaled. The Baltic Dry Index has gone a bit further south than I thought it would. Look at it on log scale might explain why, given this big arc. So he put it on log scale, and basically he put an arc to it, and we could be putting in this arc where we'll eventually work our way higher uh, over time on a log scale um, scale on it. So that's the Baltic Dry Index. I'm a I'm bullish Baltic Dry Index. Uh, I am bullish basically anything commodity related. Uh, if the market conditions are bullish, it doesn't mean that a commodity can't go lower. Uh, we're seeing that in natural gas, and I'm I'm positioned in natural gas. Um, but we can see large fluctuations in volatility throughout the the bull market. Uh, and right now, Baltic Dry Index is pretty low. Uh, natural gas is very low. We we're going to go over that uh, again. And uh, we're also seeing it against uh, uranium versus natural gas. So this is physical uranium versus the price of natural gas. It says, I would suspect a pullback in this ratio very soon, given the angle and overbought condition. Uh, so this is uranium. Uranium's outperforming as it goes up. Uh, obviously, natural gas has been getting absolutely slaughtered to the downside, and that's the majority of this move. But looking at it from a ratio perspective, natural gas is actually getting pretty cheap, where we could see a counter trend move where natural gas normalizes, so to speak. Uh, the timing of it, we don't know that. It may take some time for this to really consolidate up here and turn around. Uh, I don't think it will be immediate. It took a little bit of time, and this is on a weekly candlestick basis here. If you were to look to say that this is a breakout there, it's you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 months before this really started to head lower. So. If you notice, it was May timeframe when this kind of turned around, May, June timeframe. So looking at um, another one here, this is natural gas. So I thought we would bottom at around 350, but the confirmation signal never came. However, zooming out gives us a long-term picture. Down at the 17 years long trend line, it's a massive uh, supply zone. Currently at $270. So this is a long-term chart of natural gas. He's got a couple of contact points, one here, one there, and this guy, which makes it a valid trend line getting the three. Then we came and we're, we're selling off quite rapidly. And again, it's, it's based off of the weather in both America and the weather over in Europe. And I'm not talking about short, short-term weather. I'm talking about the average temperature over a, a period of time, which really draws down our inventories. So in the short term, we are seeing a lot of selling pressure on natural gas, which I think will eventually bear a very good buying opportunity but on a long-term trend line we could be right at that trend line right now and maybe it'll act a little bit as support we'll have to wait and see if the price responds to this trend line and if we can start to turn around there's a lot of momentum behind this move and it may take a little bit for this to turn around and it usually requires a lead-in pattern is what i call it and we'll get into that here's another one this is natural gas futures so we were scribing out uh, a consolidation period basically and we came on up and back this would also be one hump two hump and then the third hump and we blew out to the downside with that warmer weather and whatever so we were we were putting in a consolidation then we would have a lead-in pattern to another lead-in so this is one two three and then a lead-in pattern and then we usually break higher but we blew to the downside when you blow to the downside that's generally where the opportunities uh, arise themselves. Why is that an opportunity? So when you look at these opportunities, usually what happens is you go to a level that's very low, uh, potentially below the cost curve of some of these natural gas producers. Then your supply gets cut back quite dramatically. And then if there's demand out in the future, which there will be uh, from these liquefied natural gas terminals coming back online, and we have to fill back up Europe's uh, inventory 
in the quote shoulder season that will uh, move on up at some point um, where things get tight again. That's kind of the uh, the supply demand balancing factor. And right now we are definitely low, and we could even go lower if the sentiment is short, you know, bearish enough in the short term. But I do think we're quite low, and I'll show you why I think that. So this is Elliott wave theory. Uh, a lot of the stuff moves in in three waves. It's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, it's at three up waves, one, third, and the fifth. And if we were to kind of look at this <clears throat> and back out, this is the this whole portion here. This is number one, number two, and don't worry about these these other ones. It's it's actually like this: number one, number two. Number three is actually up here. This is this is from uh, Jesse Livermore cylinder. Number four is here, and then for number five, we'll just delete these two. Number five is here at the top. That's why you get this shoulder head shoulder pattern. We broke that to the downside, came all the way down. We came back into and this is a three, so three four, or sorry three four five. A B C. The B is this. The the this is the uh, blue A, blue B, blue A, blue B. Then we go one, two, third. The third leg blew out here, and we we did a three, four, and now we're almost to the bottom of C here. That's where I've got C. And forget seven because that was from a Jesse Livermore accumulation zone. So I think we're real close. Uh, I thought we were going to get more in this zone in here around four dollars 450 somewhere in that range i thought we were going to get some good support uh but guess what we didn't get that support the market is the market it pushed it lower we had uh weather that was not favorable for natural gas and we're down here we haven't turned around yet generally you get a lead-in pattern the lead-in pattern uh is this guy here that's that lead-in pattern you get a couple of, of humps usually that's one of the lead-in patterns and you get from one to two three to four and it, and it starts over this cycle again. So if we kind of look at the beginning here of how we led in, um, notice that we came all the way back down and then we had a little bit of like moving around here. That's what I think is going to happen at the bottom here. So this general area down here is going to happen again uh, over here. And then we're going to start the cycle again. So that cycle just goes over and over and over and over. Um, it can be distorted. They can be larger. They can be smaller. Um, and like here's another cycle as you go up, then your your topping pattern, and then you go into an ABC correction. And then the lead-in pattern for this one is that guy right there. That's the lead-in here. That guy is this guy here. And then it's also right here is the lead-in pattern. That's that's the same type of pattern there before a big move. The move, it the size of the move is dependent on the uh, fractals in uh, the, the the fundamentals in the system, not the fractal, the fundamentals. The fundamentals will drive it. So if we still have shortages in this system, which I think uh, are definitely uh, prevalent, and if this this could even be a Livermore accumulation cylinder that we go into another large move that comes up, uh, which I think is possible, um, we very well could have a very large move depending on weather. Depending on the summer, depending on the winter, depending on Europe's winter and summer, all those things. Depending on if they turn back on their their uh, industry, um, turning back on their smelters and all that other stuff. But right now, we are very close to a bottom, and we just have to see that lead-in pattern and movement sideways uh, occur before I become, I'll say, ultra bullish. Um, would I be cost averaging in? Yeah, I would be uh, at these levels very slowly. No, I don't use any margin. I don't use any leverage, uh, but we are very, very cheap down here. Uh, and I think we're getting very close to the end of this move somewhere. I don't know where exactly it's going to end, but it should be probably pretty soon. And it very well could extend even down below $2 if it wants to. If the moment, I mean, the momentum is there, it could go further down. That is a possibility. So that's natural gas <clears throat> and my opinions around it. Uh, I, I thought this was just funny. He said, two idiots are collectively more stupid than a single idiot. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Um, now, here's something else on, uh, this is the 10-year yields. 
And it says, to me, this is what an inverse head and shoulders look like. So what we've got here is a shoulder. So if you draw a neckline across here, you've got a shoulder, a head, and a shoulder uh, that is inverted, which means that we could go higher on our 10-year bond yields. Uh, yields going higher means mortgage rates could go higher. Uh, inflation is probably going to be higher uh, and, and, and the such given this uh, setup. So one thing to think of is generally yields go up with the price of energy. And the price of energy is very low right now. So there could be a gigantic opportunity in natural gas and in uh, oil and yields moving higher, that which is an inverted head and shoulders, is kind of setting that up. Uh, that also means that if we do get this as a, as a breakout to the upside, that money still wants to rotate out of bonds. It means bonds are being sold off for whatever reason, and it's going to find a new home somewhere else. It could be precious metals. It could be um, somewhere in commodities. It could be in the stock market. Uh, if interest rates are going up, it's probably not going to be in the stock market or tech stocks, I should say. It's probably not going to be in tech stocks. It's probably going to be somewhere like commodities, uh, oil, real estate, any of those. Money's going to find a new home, and, and this is showing us that it could potentially break to the upside, which means selling pressure in bonds. Now, here's Peter Lynch. I do want to say, it says Peter Lynch on market technical analysis here. It says, Thousands of experts study overbought indicators, head and shoulder patterns, put call ratios, the Fed's policy on money supply, and they can't predict markets with any useful consistency any more than a gizzard squeezers could tell the Roman emperors when the hens would attack. And I would say on a short-term basis, he is 100% correct. Um, on the short term, things can move any direction. Uh, you're not going to be able to, to predict the weather. You're not going to be able to predict a natural disaster, perhaps, um, with the certainty that I think what, what most people um, could, could say. And you can't predict the, the short-term movements. I do think that technical analysis has greater merits the longer time frames you look at something. So I, I do think that is the case. But one of the things, even though I looked at natural gas and we looked at Elliott Wave uh, theory, you can't, you you don't necessarily predict the size of any of these things. They can distort, they can squeeze up, and it doesn't. If the weather didn't occur here, what we would have had is a very small, shallow pullback, probably at about 450, and then taken off again in a much larger upswing move. But the weather and the other underlying fundamentals basically sold this off to the downside and you can see all the selling pressure and there's probably a lot of people who got long as well and too many people got on the wrong side and everyone's trying to cover their long bets and that happens it happens but i wanted to share that uh, another thing it says if uh, china's reopening is unequivocally bullish for commodities and so far is far from priced into the oil market the rbc analyst said expecting WTI prices will average $92 a barrel for the year. Uh, if we are lower than 92 barrels in the front half of the year, that means that we're going to be higher than 92 barrels in the back half to have the average be 92. Uh, could that be the, the case? It very well could be. Very well could be. Now, I don't know if that, you know, I don't really go out for predictions. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, what I see and how I position is based off deficits in the market. If I see good entry points, I see good patterns on the entry point, and I think there's deficits out in the future. Uh, I go long and I just stay long. I don't try to play the short term. I just do the big picture view, stay long, don't worry about it. Um, here's one that says, if, if very strong global recession is currently weighing down oil prices, what happens after? <laughs> Agreed. Uh, it says, the lack of any meaningful bounce in oil prices is the biggest puzzle in global markets. OPEC plus production cut didn't yield a bounce. Neither did the G7 cap and neither is China reopening now. The answer to this puzzle, a very strong global recession dynamic is weighing on demand. Uh, and this is his opinion. Uh, but Josh, just like he said, if very strong global recession is currently weighing down oil prices, what happens after that? And I agree. And it's going to take time for China reopening to gain traction. It's not immediate. So I think this is 
I would say very early in the in the stages, and we're supposed to be building inventory. We're not. We're not really building inventory. So I would say yes, we've held the commercial inventories by flooding the market with strategic petroleum reserves. But I don't know how that would be bearish by any stretch of, of imagination. That would be bullish because all you're doing is you're draining all the inventories anywhere in the world, whether it's commercial or strategic, and we're just draining. Them. That's how they're holding the price down. So I would say that this statement here is not puzzling. It's just flat out wrong. It's like the lack of any meaningful bounce in oil prices because we dropped 300 million barrels from strategic petroleum reserves is the biggest puzzle in global markets. No, it's not. We dropped 300 million barrels of oil on the market. That's how we did it. And now we're going to be in build season because usually the, the strongest demand is uh, winter and summer. <clears throat> but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Here's uranium prices. I know this person put numbers on it. I'm not too worried about the numbers. I just thought it was cool because this is definitely turning. And you can see the three humps. The, the, the first hump, the second hump, the third hump, the lead-in pattern there, and then we go into a bull market. That's actually got the two lead-in patterns. And then we get a, a start of a move higher. So that, I think that looks fantastic. I always like looking at that chart. Uh, here's another one for oil. It says, a good close north of the small blue neckline at 81.50 should set the stage uh, to run for the next neckline of possibly a bigger uh, inverse head and shoulder formation. And oil put in a, a little, you know, shoulder, head, shoulder with a with a neckline that's basically at a 45 degree. We could be putting, and it's not scribed out yet, a larger head and shoulder where it's a shoulder, a head, and then we come up and do another shoulder. That is a possibility. Uh, we'll find out what we do uh, over time. Here is, if you adjust for inflation and discount the 2020 pandemic outlier, natural gas has only been cheaper than it is now on one other occasion in the over 25 years. Adjusting for inflation, it's tagged 210. And, and right here on an inflation-adjusted basis, uh, 2015 was the cheapest, which would be down here, I think. For, yeah, 2015 at the end of 2015 or so, somewhere in this range there. But uh, I think that's a... It's a great opportunity in natural gas to be looking uh, when this thing turns around and kind of bases out. Now, here's um, more about natural gas. It says, when supply overwhelms, demand production drops. There's a break-even price for everything produced, including natural gas. With 4.5% interest rates, it's around $2.5 a million BTU from dry well production. Uh, so that is your break-even point. And here's the economics. Gas well had break-even points per million. 327 263 $1.30, $1.67, $1.77, and so forth. So the Permian, Eagle Ford, and, and the other Permian in Delaware are losing money uh, at current prices. And then these guys are still positive in these areas up here. Marcellus, Utica, and whatnot. Haynesville. So that's what we've got um, for basically a um, break-even point. With four and a half percent interest rates, two and a half dollars. So that's your that's your cost break even cost or your your um, cost of production where things could get pulled back. And this is your high your low cost to high cost producer. <clears throat> um, this is uranium. It says hard to imagine this is anywhere close to being priced in. For years, we've all paid lip service to potential production issues, but the narrative often fades away as nothing actually happens. And this is Kazatom Prom. Uh, and their production is really kind of being lowered. It says now after only three months, they have lowered their 2023 by 1,800 tons. Um, Charlie Munger, it says people tend to understand. Yeah, I already talked about that. So we'll end it there, guys. Lots of natural gas that we talked about, a little bit of uranium, a little bit of oil. Um, I'm still a massive bull in commodities. And right now, we have pulled back, and I'm on the prowl looking for opportunities out there. Uh, I still own all my positions. I'm still long, and I will add to my positions when these things bottom out and get moving. Uh, oil, oil looks pretty good, and I would say natural gas still needs some time to kind of turn around and get that momentum to, to turn and bottom. But uh, energy service companies still look very good. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity across commodities. I think the 
market conditions for these to continue higher are still there. Uh, we can see that with the inverted head and shoulders uh, potential in the yields, which means yields could go higher still. Uh, if yields go higher, I think the stock market's going to buckle under pressure and probably go lower. I think bond prices are obviously going to go lower unless they do some sort of QE uh, to slow that yield, the, the pressure of yields going higher. They're going to need some sort of buying pressure. Um, so maybe they do QE in the future. I don't know. Maybe they're already doing it. The Treasury outside of the Federal Reserve. Not too sure on that. But um, yeah, that's where I think we're at. And uh, I look for things that are down. <clears throat> natural gas is something that has definitely got my attention. I love natural gas. And I think it, I think we're going to get a bottom here at some point uh, over the next some months. And there's your opportunity. So if you guys like the content, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to your you know, subscribe to the channel, uh, and we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.